welcome to this lecture number 28 on this NPTEL course in fluid mechanics for chemical engineering undergraduate students. So far in this course we have discussed two major approaches towards analyzing fluid flow problems that occur in chemical engineering. One is the integral balances, integral balances or macroscopic balances. Here we write integral balances of mass, momentum and energy over a control volume and when we do this we can choose the control volume to be uh, to comprise of various flow equipment such as pumps or pipes or compressors or valves and so on and we can do this macroscopic balances, but to solve these macroscopic balances importantly we need some inputs the inputs to solve the macroscopic balances are the viscous losses, viscous losses that occur in various parts of the system like flow in pipes or flow through a valve or flow in a sudden expansion there are always viscous losses. We need that as an input and we also need the forces exerted on solid surfaces as an input ok. Unless we provide these as an input to the macroscopic or integral balances we may not be able to solve them fully accurately. But in many occasions because we do not have a knowledge accurate knowledge of this we can neglect this and get an approximate answer to various flow problems and this we highlighted in some of the examples that we did before but these are not entirely up accurate because uh, we are neglecting some important factors such as viscous losses or forces viscous forces exerted by the uh, solid uh, drag forces exerted by the solid on the fluid surfaces. Since we neglect them we may get only approximate answers, but um, this is one extreme the other thing that we did was differential balances. or microscopic balances or microscopic balances. Okay. Now, the end result of all the analysis on in microscopic balances can be summarized in a very simple way for an incompressible Newtonian fluid ok and it, it is deceptively simple because even though we can write down the equations in a very simple way for the flow of an in incompressible liquid ok. The solution of these so called Navier-Stokes equations are notoriously difficult ok because in a very very general setting the Navier-Stokes equations are non-linear couple partial differential equations and solving them in their most general and uh, form is, is a very very difficult task. So, we had to end up making simplifications such as flow is only in one direction the flow is steady and the flow velocity varies only in one direction and so on you, we had to make several simplifying assumptions and we can get the solution. But the advantage of differential balances is that you do not need any input other than saying that what is the viscosity of the fluid and what is the density of the fluid. And once you know what is the viscosity as an input from an experiment and density as an input and once you provide suitable boundary conditions to the flow in principle one can solve them ok, uh, but in practice the solution is very difficult ok. So, we had to make all these simplifying assumptions, but we also pointed out that the solutions that one gets by making the simplifying assumptions are not unique. For example, for flow in a pipe we obtained a solution called the Hagen Poisley velocity profile ok using the differential balances. So, this is the pipe, but the solution that we got ok is not always observed in reality because the, the assumptions that we make 
fail when the velocities are sufficiently high or when the Reynolds number is greater than 2000. Okay. This simple solution which is obtained by solution not observed in experiments. Okay. Now, therefore, even though for Reynolds number smaller than 2000, we can get an accurate description of how much pressure drop is required to make uh, the fluid flow at a given flow rate. We cannot have the same luxury when the Reynolds number is greater than 2000, because the simplifying assumptions that we made uh, to solve the Navier-Stokes equations, they are not correct. The flow becomes more complicated or specifically turbulent. So, it is not uh, enough to solve the Navier-Stokes equations with such simplifying approximations. One has to in principle solve the full Navier-Stokes equations, which is a very, very difficult uh, problem. Uh, in principle, one has to use very sophisticated uh, numerical algorithms and uh, high performance computers to be able to solve the Navier-Stokes equations in the turbulent regime. So, we have these opposing requirements. On the one hand, integral balances are relatively simple to solve, but they need some input such as uh, viscous losses, while differential balances they do not need any inputs external inputs. You, all you have to give is the viscosity of the fluid and the density of the fluid through ex a single experiment and then everything is specified, but the solution is very, very difficult uh, unless one is prepared to go to very sophisticated computation. Okay. So, but in industrial practice in chemical engineering often the equipment the process equipments that one has they are exceptionally complex. Okay. So, one cannot often uh, one cannot always hope to use differential balances to solve for example, uh, the flow problems uh, in chemical engineering. Although one can make an attempt, it is not always feasible. Uh, the main reason is that in chemical engineering applications, the flow in chemical engineering or chemical process industries okay, flow is often turbulent. and flow is often multi phase by which I mean you may have fluid flow I mean a flow of a suspension of solids and a fluid together. Okay. So, and we may have to estimate what is the pressure drop to make such a complex suspension flow in a pipe and for which uh, we cannot use the differential balance, because uh, differential balances work only for a simple Newtonian fluid. Okay. So, and the flow is often rheologically complex, even if it is effectively a single phase flow, you may have flow of a polymer molten plastic, which is a very, very complex uh, liquid in terms of its rheology. Okay. It may not be described by a simple Newtonian fluid. Okay. So, it is not sufficient for us to just use the differential balances in many industrial setting. Al although we, we will hope to use the differential balances as much as possible, because they are very, very accurate in their uh, in their results, but the solution of the differential balances is very, very difficult. So, the third uh, way of analyzing problems is through experimentation in industrial design. Okay. So, we have to carry out experiments. For example, if we say fluid is flowing in the turbulent regime okay, uh, in a pipe, we cannot know what is the flow rate that is required, what is the flow rate that will come out if you apply a given pressure drop. For laminar flow, we know the answer. Okay. We have already solved for that answer from differential balances. For turbulent flow, we do not know the answer from first principles through from the Navier Stokes equations. So, if you want to design a pump. Okay, to make a fluid flow at a given flow rate or if you want to predict how much fluid will flow, uh, what is the flow rate of a fluid for a given pressure drop in a turbulent regime, then clearly we have to resort to experiments. Okay. Now, doing experiments in the laboratory is often okay, simplified okay, and it is much made much more organized and logical by doing what is called 
dimensional analysis and that is the topic of our discussion today. Okay. So, in the absence of any solution to a problem okay, uh, through differential balances, we have to resort to experiments and experiments are made much, much more logical and organized and simplified if you use the principles of dimensional analysis okay. and that is go the goal of our current discussion to illustrate uh, the principles underlying the uh, underlying dimensional analysis and their applications. Okay. Now, I am going to illustrate first the nature of dimensional analysis using a very simple problem. The problem is drag force on a sphere. Imagine a sphere moving with a constant velocity, you have a sphere of radius r a nice rigid sphere and it is moving with a constant velocity u in a fluid and the fluid has viscosity mu and density rho. Okay. In many applications we want to know what is the force resistance force that is experienced by the sphere okay. uh, due to the fact that when the sphere is moving through a fluid okay, it has to okay, when the sphere is moving through a fluid. Okay, it has to push the fluid around it okay, in order to move and when the fluid flows relative to a solid surface such as this, okay, this is a solid. Okay, when the fluid flows around the solid surface, there is relative motion between the fluid and solid. That means, that there are viscous stresses. Whenever there is a relative motion okay, between two fluid elements or between a fluid and solid element, there are viscous stresses and when you consider the sum total of all viscous stresses exerted by the flow on the solid surface, you get a net force that opposes the motion of the sphere that is called the drag force okay that is the drag force the drag force on a solid object such as a sphere is the net force that opposes the motion of the solid surface a solid object because when the solid object moves through a fluid it has to push the fluid around and when the fluid moves around a solid surface it exerts a viscous shear stress okay and that is the concept of the drag force. Now, suppose you want to know uh, what is a drag force on a sphere okay, and what type of experiments that we should do. Okay. So, let us first do a simple, uh, let us first estimate this problem. Okay. Suppose you want to know drag force on, you want to have experiments that correlate the drag force on a sphere on the various physical parameters that affect the problem. Okay. So, so, first we want to ask what are the variables in which the drag force will be a function of. So, let us denote the drag force to be f, okay. the drag force is denoted by the symbol f. Okay. If f is a drag force, what is it a function of? is a function this is of various variables we may imagine that it is a function of the radius r okay or let us say diameter d d is the diameter of the sphere we may imagine that it's a function of the velocity of the sphere because if the sphere moves with a higher velocity we may expect that the force experienced by the sphere is different compared to when it's moving at low velocity we may imagine that it's a function of viscosity mu density rho. Okay. We may have other uh, variables such as the uh, surface tension or interfacial tension between the fluid and solid, uh, but this is a judgment that one has to make. What are the variables on which the given uh, physical observable such as drag force should be a function of. We may have many variables that affect the problem, but we expect at this point of time that these are the most relevant physical variables upon which the drag force will be a function of. Okay. And if there are more variables in the problem, then it will show up later while doing experiments. Okay. So, these are the um, variables that we think are the most important variables that will affect the drag force on a sphere. Okay. Now, if you want to find out how the drag force is going to vary with all these parameters, you have four parameters. 
the diameter of the sphere, the velocity of the sphere, let us call the velocity v. Okay. So, we have four parameters upon which the drag force can depend on and we want to find the parametric variation of the force on all the four parameters. Now, let us imagine how we will do experiments in a simplistic way. Well, first we will say that in order to find how f is affected by v, okay, okay, you fix d mu rho and let us say we measure 10 different values of we have 10 different values of velocity of v and we measure 10 different values of f correspondingly okay 10 values then so all we would say now all we would have is that for a given diameter viscosity and density how does the force vary with the velocity now you may say that well we want to know how the force varies with the diameter so you fix the velocity viscosity density and then find f as a function of of d again you may have 10 different values so to find how f depends on just two parameters such as velocity and density you already have 10 different values of velocity and 10 sorry velocity and diameter you already have 10 different values of velocity and 10 different values of diameter you already have 100 data points okay so you may even um, it's not even easy to plot these 100 data points as a function of these two variables uh, diameter and velocity but you have other parameters you have uh, f as if suppose you want to find the uh, force uh, how the force depends drag force depends on the viscosity so you have to fix the velocity diameter density and then find f as a function of viscosity again you have let us say 10 different values that is you may choose 10 different fluids of different viscosities and then find f and finally you may have to find how f varies as a function of density so you fix velocity diameter and viscosity and find f as a function of rho again you may have 10 values say so if you consider all the data points that you want to generate to find how f depends on these four parameters namely uh, the diameter the visco velocity velocity diameter viscosity and density you have 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 10 to the 4 data points okay so so you have to do 10 to the 4 experiments to find all these 10000 experiments which is extremely tedious okay, and cumbersome and even if you generate those 10 to the 4 data points how are you going to make sense out of this 10 to, 10 to the 4 data points because you have four independent variables upon which f is a function of upon which f depends on. So, how are we even going to plot such a large number of data points with a which in which f depends on four independent variables. So, it is not at all an easy task. Secondly, doing 10 to the 4 experiments is also not easy because if each experiment uh, takes about uh, 30 minutes, then you can you can say that you can estimate that 10 to the 4 experiments will take 10 to the 4 times 30 minutes, which will be a very very large number of time. It's about two years. So to find how the drag force depends on four variables, okay, and with just 10 data points for each variable we already find that we we have to do many many experiments with order of 10 to the 4 and it is going to take a long long time to complete the data. Now even after completing the experiment making sense out of the data in order to see any trend or to analyze the data is also extremely difficult and cumbersome. So clearly there has to be a better way to do experiments and this is where dimensional analysis plays an important role. What dimensional analysis does is that
I am first going to make a claim and then I will of course, show how this comes about. What dimensional analysis tells us is that for this drag force problem, if you do dimensional analysis correctly, then you can write the function relationship between you have 5 variables f d v rho mu. Okay. The function relationship among these 5 variables can be written as a functional relationship between just 2 groups, but these groups are non dimensional. Okay. Okay, you can show we will show will prove that f this function relationship among these 5 variables can be written as d square is a function of rho v d by mu. Okay. These two groups are non dimensional these two groups are non dimensional. Okay. By non dimensional we mean that if you check the dimensions of this groups they will they'll be mere numbers they would not have any physical dimensions such as length mass or force or acceleration anything associated with them they will be pure numbers such pure numbers are called non dimensional groups or dimensionless groups they are also called dimensionless. groups. So, you have some some terms okay, which are purely non dimensional or dimensionless and we will later show that the relationship between all these 5 variables the force, velocity, diameter, viscosity, density can be written as a non dimensional uh, as a relation between just 2 non dimensional groups which is a great simplification. Now, we will also point out that the form of this function, the form of the function is still undetermined. Is not determined by dimensional analysis. the form of the function is not determined by dimensional analysis. We still have to do experiments, but remember that in contrast to doing 10 to the 4 data points or 10 to the 4 experiments, we simply have to do just you have to find the functional dependence of one variable on another variable one group on another group. We simply have to do 10 experiments. Okay. So, the functional relationship among 5 variables is now reduced to a functional relationship among only 2 non dimensional groups. Now, first of all it it, it leads to greater I mean uh, great amount of simplification, because firstly the number of experiments that you have to do decreases by an order of uh, 3 orders of magnitude from 10 to the 4 experiments we are down now to only 10 experiments, which are fairly easy to do in a laboratory. Secondly, in the previous case if you want to know how function the force depends on viscosity we have to do 10 different fluids because you have to find 10 different fluids of 10 different viscosity and only then you will be able to find how force depends on all these 10 different viscosities or 10 viscous fluid 10 different viscous fluids. Now, here since only we are saying that there is a relationship among these two groups we can choose the fluid to be anything that is conveniently available to us. For example, we may use water or air which is conveniently available. Okay. So, we can use the same fluid, okay. we can just use the same sphere and we can make it fall at different velocity move at different velocity or we can use the same velocity. And uh, so, when you choose this give, given fluid fixed for a given fluid the viscosity and density are already fixed if you choose let us say air or water. So, the only parameters you have in order to generate 10 data points is either the diameter of the sphere or the velocity at which the sphere is moving. So, depending on experimental convenience we can choose either one of this and generate 10 data points just by varying let us say 
the diameter of the sphere. Let us say we cannot uh, change the velocity for some reason. We have uh, an experimental setup where the sphere is moving only at a given velocity let us say uh, 10 meters per second or 1 meter per second. Then the only variable that we have to vary is the diameter and let us say we choose steel balls of different diameters 10 different diameters. So, we can achieve we can easily carry out these experiments and write everything in terms of this non dimensional groups. Now, once you find this non dimensional functional relation between this non dimensional group which is a non dimensional force and this non dimensional group which is essentially the Reynolds number which we pointed out in the context of uh, transition from laminar to turbulent flow in a pipe. Okay. Uh, we will come to this shortly the interpretation of Reynolds number, but once you find this functional relationship between two these two non dimensional groups then in principle you can find the force the dependence of drag force on any sphere or in a fluid with any any property any velocity any viscosity and any density and the sphere vel uh, velocity can also be anything the sphere diameter can be anything. Okay. So, but so let us say now we have found that f by rho v square d square is a function of rho v d by mu and let us say we have generated how f varies with f by rho v square d square varies with rho v d by mu. Let us say we have this data points let us say this is the data experimental data. Okay. Now, if somebody comes and tells you that they have the motion of a sphere and let us say we have generated this experimental data with water and uh, steel balls uh, of some let us say millimeter diameter. Okay. If somebody comes and says that they want to find the drag force on a sphere of diameter let us say uh, 10 centimeters okay. and the more the fluid in which it is flowing is not water, but it is a very viscous oil okay. then how are we going to do that how are we going to compute uh, the drag force all we want to know is what is the velocity at which the sphere is moving. Okay. We need to know this because if somebody wants to compute the drag force on an object they should first tell you what is the velocity at which the, the object like a sphere is moving. So, somebody is telling you that as a steel ball of 10 centimeter diameter is moving in a very viscous liquid like castor oil okay. and diameter is 10 centimeters and the velocity is given to us let us say it is 1 centimeter per second. Then we can compute the Reynolds this group because we know the density of the once you say it is a given oil then viscosity and density are fixed we know the diameter of the sphere we know the velocity of the sphere. Then we know this group. So, let us say that value of the group is here. Now, we have to simply walk across to the y coordinate and find what is this group. So, what this graph is going to tell you is what is f by rho v square d square, but we already know what is rho which is the density of the castor oil which we already know what is d which is the velocity which velocity with which the big sphere is moving and we also know, we already know the diameter of the sphere and this is the only unknown which can be computed. Because we already know what is this combination f by rho v square d square from this graph, but this graph was obtained for a completely different system. It was obtained for motion of let us say a 1 mm or 5 mm steel ball in water and that is how you made this graph by suitably non dimensionalizing the variables, but now once you have done that that graph that you have obtained and which you have plotted in terms of these non dimensional groups is valid for any problem provided the Newton uh, the provided the fluid is Newtonian okay. and you can find out the drag force on any object of any dimension moving through any fluid with any viscosity. Okay. So, that is the power of dimensional analysis that first of all it is able to reduce the amount of experimentation. Secondly, now you are able to do experiments on things that are easily available in your laboratory. Let us say you have a very tiny steel ball of 5 mm diameter and you have water readily available in your laboratory. You can do the experiment, but replot or 
you have to uh, report the experimental data or uh, reanalyze or regroup the experimental data in terms of these non dimensional groups f by f divided by rho v squared d squared and rho v uh, d by mu once you do that then the results of such a graph are valid for any sphere of any diameter moving with any velocity in any fluid so long as the fluid is newtonian because in your lab you have used water as the only as a as a test fluid to to get these results so this is one very very important simplification that one gets now suppose let us say you do not have the data for uh, f you know you know you have not done many experiments to get this data okay but still you you want to know what is the drag force on a sphere with diameter d1 okay let's say d d prototype okay and the velocity of the sphere is v prototype moving in a liquid of viscosity mu prototype and density rho prototype what is the drag force experienced by this let us say this is a very very huge sphere moving in a very viscous liquid we want to know this but we do not have access to the data like before we do not have have this non dimensional relationship between f by rho v squared d squared and rho v d by mu suppose you do not have this how are we going to estimate this drag force we want this we want to compute this in some application now in order to do this we can scale down the problem okay in the following way first compute the reynolds number rho p vp dp of the prototype this is the non dimensional group called the reynolds number which i have encountered we have encountered before first compute the reynolds number of the prototype okay now construct a laboratory model construct a laboratory model in which you choose a liquid that is conveniently available to you a model liquid rho m with density m you choose a velocity that is feasible to you choose a sphere of diameter that is feasible to you in such a manner that this reynolds number is identical to the prototype reynolds number re model should be equal to re prototype that is you should choose these values rho v d mu such that the reynolds numbers of the model and prototype are the same then what dimensional analysis is going to tell you which we'll show shortly okay that f by rho v squared d squared is a function only of rho v d by mu if that is the case then once you fix the reynolds number so the non dimensional force drag force on an object is a function only of reynolds number since we have fixed the reynolds number of model to be the same as reynolds number of prototype what this equation is telling us is that f by rho v squared d squared for the model should be the same as f by rho v squared d squared for the prototype now for the model we can measure the drag force so this becomes f model by rho model v model squared d model squared so you measure f for the model you measure this you measure this okay now this should also be equal to f prototype by rho prototype v prototype squared d prototype squared now we know what is the density of the liquid in the prototype in the real situation we know what is the velocity at which the sphere is moving we know what is the uh, diameter of the prototype uh, sphere particle so since and we also know the density of the model liquid the velocity at which you are making the sphere move in, in the model and the diameter of the sphere so the only unknown 
can be computed. Okay. So, you need not have the entire data uh, uh, as to how f by rho v squared d squared depends on uh, the non dimensional group rho v d by mu that is the Reynolds number. So, long as you know what is the Reynolds number at which the prototype is operating and if you match the Reynolds number of the prototype with the Reynolds number at which you are carrying out experiment in the in the lab and in which you can easily measure the force then it is much easier to compute the force that will be experienced drag force that will be experienced by the prototype particle just from this relation. And why is this possible all this is possible is because of dimensional analysis because dimensional analysis tells us that the functional relation between f rho v d mu can be written as f by rho v square d square is function of rho v d by mu. Okay. This is made possible by dimensional analysis. Okay. So, first thing many many simplifications come by dimensional analysis one is the notion of reducing the number of experimentation to obtain a functional relationship between many variables. Secondly once you once dimensional analysis tells us that it, the relationship between the drag force uh, and the various uh, parameters is only through this non dimensional uh, form then in order to find the force on a, a real situation a prototype situation. Okay, whereas a larger sphere is moving let us say through a very viscous liquid all we have to do is to find the Reynolds number of the prototype. Now, do a similar experiment in the lab okay, by matching the same Reynolds number, but by using fluids and spheres that are readily available to us and velocities that are easily feasible in the lab. As long as you match the Reynolds number then the non dimensional force on the model in the fourth prototype must be identical because at a given Reynolds number there is a unique relationship between these two non dimensional groups. So, once I know what is the non dimensional force this group on the uh, model then that should be the same on the prototype then by knowing the, uh, the velocity of the prototype diameter of the prototype and density of the prototype liquid we can calculate what is the drag force experienced by a prototype. Okay. So, this is the most important lesson that one gets from dimensional analysis. Okay. So, far we have told you the advantages and consequences and applications of dimensional analysis, but we have yet not yet told you how to achieve this relation this non dimensional relation. Okay. How to get this now that is what we are going to do next and that is through a principle called Buckingham's pi theorem. Okay. Suppose you have a function relationship among five variables let us say the functional relationship is denoted by this small letter g. So, you have this five variables force diameter density velocity viscosity okay. and this is the function we want to determine through experiments. Okay. In general this is the functional relationship. In general I can generalize this to okay, a function relationship among n variables. So, now I am going to generalize the discussion not restrict ourselves to the drag force, but of course from time to time I will draw comparisons between the general formulation as well as the specific problem of drag force on a sphere. Okay. So, in general let us say there are q 1, q 2, q 3 so on up to q n variables and so there are n dimensional 
parameters. And you want to find a relationship among these n dimensional parameters. Okay. Now, what the pi theorem tells us is that you can write this functional relationship among n dimensional parameters as a functional relationship among n minus 1 non dimension n minus m non dimensional groups okay where pi 1 so let me explain the notation pi 1 pi 2 pi 3 and so on up to pi n okay n minus m they are non dimensional groups okay they are non dimensional groups they are dimensionless groups in other words and m is the number of fundamental dimensions in the problem okay what do we mean by number of fundamental dimensions? The fundamental dimensions is in any physical problem are mass, length, time, uh, temperature and so on. Okay. So, these are the fundamental dimensions present in a problem in a physical problem. So, and n m is the minimum number of fundamental dimensions okay. fundamental dimensions present in the problem used to describe uh, all the parameters okay so let us now go to the sphere problem sphere drag problem you had how many variables you had g as a function of f v d mu rho is 0 so you had n equals five variables and the fundamental dimensions are mass length and time if you look at the dimensions of all the parameters okay then you will find that there are only three fundamental dimensions so m is 3 with these three fundamental dimensions we can describe the dimensions of all the variables there is no need to go this is the minimum number of fundamental dimensions that is that are used to describe all the variables the dimensions of all the physical variables present present in the problem. So, that is 3 for this case. So, what pi theorem is telling us is that the number of dimensionless or non dimensional groups is phi minus 3 is equal to 2 and those two groups uh, an illustration or uh, or an Okay. Uh, an example of those two groups are what uh, are what we wrote before f by rho v squared and um, rho v d by mu. Okay. An example of such two groups non dimensional groups are these things okay, are these two groups. So, the pi theorem for the problem of drag force on a sphere tells us that the functional relationship among five dimensional physical variables namely f v rho mu d can be represented as a functional relationship among only two non dimensional groups and the pi theorem will also tell you how to derive those two non dimensional groups. Okay. So, but again the pi theorem or dimensional analysis does not tell you what is the functional what is the nature of the function between the two non dimensional groups that is not told by dimensional analysis that still has to be carried out that still has to be determined only through uh, experimentation, but it does the dimensional analysis does result in a great amount of simplification by reducing the number of variables in the problem okay, by uh, from 5 to 2 initially we had 5 dimensional variables now we have only 2 dimensionless or non dimensional variables. Okay. Now, 
this n minus m pi groups the non dimensional groups are called sometimes called as pi groups are independent in the sense you cannot get one pi group by combining the other pi groups once you have found n minus m pi groups for example here you had these two pi groups you cannot get one pi group from another they are functionally related but you cannot just manipulate one uh, from the other they are independent okay of course ultimately you have to do experiments to find how this is function of that all i'm saying is that you cannot write uh, in a more complicated problem uh, you cannot write pi 1 as pi 2 by pi 3 okay because you have pi 1 pi 2 pi 3 as three independent groups okay you cannot get one in terms of the other readily okay so so all these three all in general n minus m groups are independent groups in that one cannot write one in terms of the other now suppose you do find that after doing experiments okay suppose you find that you have two only two groups and let's say you have pi 1 is a function of pi 2 and after doing experiments you find that pi 1 is equal to 1 over pi 2 this implies that pi 1 pi 2 is equal to 1 or some constant over pi 2 is this constant okay we will show later that this implies that you have overestimated the number of physically relevant uh, dimensional variables in the problem and one of those dimensional variables will automatically drop out of the functional relationship if it so happens if the physical circumstances are such that one of the variables is irrelevant then you will find that these two groups okay are not they are not simply they are very very simply related and you can combine these two groups to get a third non dimensional uh, another non dimensional group and you will find that one of the dimensional variables becomes an irrelevant variable in the problem. So, I will point, point this out uh, little later when we actually uh, when we uh, implement dimensional analysis, but now let us go through how to determine the pi groups. So, all I have said is a claim all I have said is a claim that given a set of m dimensional variables and you have given a set of n dimensional variables and you have m fundamental dimensions minimum number of fundamental dimensions required to describe the dimensions of those n dimensional variables. Then Buckingham's pi theorem tells you that you can reduce these n variables to n minus m non dimensional groups. Now, and these groups are often called as pi groups traditionally historically. How are you going to determine these pi groups? So, there is a well set uh, uh, methodology set of rules that one follows and one can uh, easily get the pi groups. Okay. Let me go through it step by step. Okay. First list all the dimensional parameters involved in the problem okay in the problem let it be n now in the case of drag force past a sphere we said that force is the of course objective is to get the force it could be a function of velocity diameter viscosity density but we neglected the interfacial tension uh, and uh, we probably neglected specific heat capacity or things like that because we felt that those variables are irrelevant to the problem. Okay. Now, how are we going to check whether the hypothesis is correct? It will be proved right by experimentation only and right now it is purely a physically motivated guess that we are saying that these are the physical variables that are relevant to the problem. Now, initially the students may find it difficult uh, to find out to to judge what are the uh, physically relevant variables to the to a given problem, but it is a matter of 
physical and engineering judgment uh, as to what these are, but with practice and with experience then one gains uh, enough experience to write down what are the relevant dimensional groups that, that affect a given problem. Now the next step is select a set of fundamental dimensions. Okay, for example, mass, length and time. Okay. Okay. Mostly in our case we can choose mass, length and time as the set of fundamental dimensions. Okay. Uh, occasionally pe people may use instead of mass a force as a fundamental dimension, but for all practical purposes you have to use only mass, length and time in fluid mechanics problems. Suppose you are doing heat transfer then you may have to add temperature as a fundamental dimension, because within the realm of classical thermodynamics temperature is another fundamental dimension. Of course, if you go to molecular theory such as statistical thermodynamics or kinetic theory, then temperature is essentially a measure of average kinetic energy of molecules. So, that becomes uh, not a fundamental dimension, but within the realm of continuum classical thermodynamics it is a fundamental dimension. So, in heat transfer we may have to use uh, um, temperature also. Okay. Now, let, let this be m the number of fundamental dimensions. Now, we have to the third step is to list the dimensions of the n physical variables. in terms of fundamental dimensions. Okay. So, we have to write what is the dimension of suppose you choose mass length and time we have to first write what is the dimension of force in terms of MLT dimensions and so on. Okay. Now, the fourth step is to select m parameters dimensional parameters okay that include all fundamental dimensions all three dimensions not all three in general all m okay and of course um, m is less than n because there are n number of uh, physical variables and out of these n number of physical variables you are choosing m physical variables which have all the three fundamental dimensions now the next step is to construct the fundamental dimensions in terms of the uh, m. So, these are called the repeated variables. So, let us give a name to them these are called the repeating variables in terms of the m repeating variables. Once you do this you take the remaining n minus m dimensional variables. and non dimensionalize them non dimensionalize them with the dimensions constructed out of 
from step 5. Okay. You have already constructed all the fundamental dimensions in terms of the m repeating variables. So, all you have to do is to take the remaining variables and non dimensionalize them. Okay. And finally, you check whether if you have done everything correctly, these n minus m dimension uh, groups will be purely non dimensional, they will not have any dimensions. Okay. We will stop at this point and we will illustrate this method uh, in the next lecture for drag force past sphere. Thank you.